Good evening. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society webinar with Dr. Sarah Tangren speaking about native grasses for use in home gardens and native meadows. I'm Ann DeNovo and I'll be your co-host along with Lynn Parsons. Um, this evening, our speaker will be uh, Dr. Sarah Tangren. She is a specialist in native landscaping, native seed production, um, meadow making, invasive plant control, the native industry, and rare plant conservation. She has done extensive restoration work, including collaborating with the Anacostia Watershed Society to restore plant communities along the Anacostia River Bank. She has also worked with the University of Maryland Arboretum and Botanical Garden to protect the rare wildflower sundial lupin. She's worked with uh, Park and Planning to establish native meadows and with PEPCO to restore a native meadow community. She established the first native gardens at the University of Maryland in 2006. She has designed and implemented native gardens for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Vice President's Mansion, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. More recently, she has taught about native plants and sustainable landscaping for the Maryland Master Gardener Program. And currently, she's conducting, a, concluding a report on native plant and seed use in the Eastern United States. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about native grasses, both in the context of home gardens and for those of you that might be interested in planting native meadows. To start, why does anybody add grasses to their landscape? Well, from a horticultural perspective, uh, grasses add a strong linear texture. They're particularly good at adding motion to the landscape because they're very responsive to the breeze. And of course, for our landscapes, we tend to pick out grasses that have large, beautiful seed heads. Unfortunately, conventionally, we have chosen alien grasses and having a big, beautiful seed head full of fertile seeds on an alien plant leads to just what you might expect, which is an invasive plant problem. So in the, uh, the photograph here, you can see some miscanthus and uh, underneath that, another alien grass. Um, well, miscanthus is also known as Chinese silver grass, I should say. And it's a really bad invasive plant problem. If you haven't had a chance to see this for yourself firsthand, I highly recommend this video. Just uh, Google on, put it in quotes, and Google on how invasive is Chinese silver grass? And, uh, you'll see for yourself. Um, then this lower grass in the photograph here is black penicetum, and uh, it's just another fertile alien grass that has uh, become quite an invasive plant problem. I did want to mention at the beginning uh, to recommend some resources for you because I know a lot of you are going to be very curious uh, how to recognize grasses. Uh, Marnie Bruce told me that Lauren has republished her book. I learned a lot of my um, native grass identification. My very first identification skills came from Lauren Brown's book. So this is very exciting. And uh, Ann just mentioned that Kevin Dodge is going to be talking about native grass ID next month. And I've heard Kevin Dodge before. He is an excellent speaker. So um, I highly recommend that. Uh, but also beginning to incorporate just a few native grasses into your own garden is really going to give you that baseline of recognition that you, you can use then to build identification skills on. 
And then um, some of you are going to want to learn about native grasses, not so much to be working with garden beds, but to actually plant a native meadow. That's a, a rather big and complicated undertaking. And so I have step-by-step -step instructions for you. Um, and I would suggest that you just, again, put in quotes, how to make a meadow in Maryland and Google on that and your very top hit will be um, some instructions, step-by-step -step instructions that I wrote. So I'm going to uh, share eight native grasses with you today. And for each one of those, I will talk about um, a sort of a sequence. I'll start with what the grass's appearance is. And then I will talk about that grass and nature, let you know a little bit of the natural history for that species. And then I will talk about the use of that grass in either a garden or a meadow setting. I'll show you some photographs of that. So starting with bottle brush grass, um, it's typically about four feet tall and it has very whitish stems and white bristly seed heads. That's where it got its name from. The, the seed heads look a little bit like uh, the brushes that you can use to clean a bottle. And the flowering and the development of the seed occurs in early summer. And a lot of people are kind of a bit surprised to hear that grasses flower. They do, um, and we'll see a little bit more about that as we move on. So in nature, bottle brush grass is found in rich woodlands, moist areas with shade, often but not always in floodplains, and in soils that have more calcium than is typical for our area. So most of the wild populations of bottle brush grass that you will find in Maryland occur west of I-95 and only over those types of bedrock that have a good amount of calcium in them. There are very few wild populations of bottle brush grass east of I-95 in the area that we call the, um, the coastal plain because most soils in the coastal plain are poor in calcium. Here's an example of bottle brush being used in a landscaping bed at the U.S. National Arboretum. As a rule of thumb, when you want to think about what growing conditions would be in your garden uh, that would be good for a native grass, look back to where that grass occurs in nature. It's not a solid rule. There are exceptions to this, as we will see in a little bit. But generally speaking, if you provide garden conditions that are similar to the wild habitat, you're going to do pretty well. So for a garden for bottle brush, you're looking at shade to part sun, moist soils or average soils, and some availability of calcium. So this is my front yard, <laughs> um, and I feel like I'm welcoming, welcoming you all to my front yard here. Uh, the bottle brush grass is here on the left, and you can see those beautiful It's just such a, a gorgeous texture. And uh, there's some shade here because of the tree. Uh, my yard is pretty typical Maryland uh, yard that does not have much calcium in the soil naturally. And a tip that you can use to overcome that and uh, still have plants that need calcium is to plant them near concrete, which is exactly what I've done here. So curbs, sidewalks, building foundations are all good sources of calcium. Also, as it happens, uh, on, growing on my curb, I have two other native grasses. This is wood oats, and this big grass back here is switchgrass, and we'll be talking about both of those shortly. Our second grass is Indian grass, and the appearance of Indian grass, it's a strong vertical statement. 
uh, typically around seven feet tall and it has a large feathery plume-like seed head, the flowers and the seeds developing in late summer or fall. And so I told you we were gonna talk a little bit about native grasses actually as flowering plants. And in the photograph here, you can see some yellow objects dangling from the branches. And those are the anthers. They are the pollen bearing organs. And the grass dangles those in the wind in such a way that the pollen gets caught on the wind. So grass pollen uh, in the wind can travel considerable distances. Now, if you look at the illustration here, you'll see on the right is a seed and the seed is covered with small hairs, the, the effect being essentially a furry seed. And that is why uh, the plumes of the Indian grass have such a lovely feathery soft texture. In nature, Indian grass is found in a really broad range of soil types. So you can find it in the clays and loams, sands, or here, Soldier's Delight is a serpentine barren. So this is a very rocky, shallow soil. So the full range of soil types. Another thing to notice about this particular photograph is that the, the feathery plumes of the Indian grass are backlit. The sun is shining towards our point of view and that just shows off the seeds of the grass. And so that's something to consider if you're landscaping with grasses is where will people see them at what times of day and what direction is the sun coming from. The Calvert County Master Gardeners have done a beautiful uh, little native garden uh, that includes Indian grass at the uh, Calvert County Extension Office. In the garden, uh, moist to dry soils, just like in nature and full sun are the ideal conditions. Here's another garden with Indian grass. Uh, in this case, the Indian grass is back here. It's towards the back of the garden, but you can see those um, gorgeous late summer feathery plumes. The third grass we're going to talk about is little blue stem. Little blue stem is fairly uniform in height at about three feet tall, as you can see in this garden right here. It has a finer texture than most grasses because it has very narrow leaf blades and narrow um, stems. And again, the seeds, the flowers and the seeds come at the end of summer and into fall. This is a close-up view of the uh, flowers and the seeds as they emerge from the stem. And if you look at any individual unit, you will, um, you will see that these are chains actually of one stacked upon another. And that's how they emerge from, from the, uh, the grass stem. And if you look at the same plant with backlight, it just becomes stunning. It also is very clear in this photograph, you can look at these little chains that you see over here, chains of these seeds that you see in the illustration. And that's a distinctive characteristic of little blue stem that you can use to help you identify it. In nature, little blue stem is found in um, stressful soils, harsh soils, harsh places, and it tends to occur in more mature meadows rather than in areas that have been recently disturbed. Uh, in this late summer meadow that's shown here, the little blue stem is the reddish or darker brown grass that you see, and these greener grasses are something else. Using a little blue stem in the garden, uh, you want to go for growing conditions, and this is a case where it's particularly true. 
that are similar to the natural habitat. You're looking for full sun and the soil can be moist or dry, but it needs to be a harsh, poor soil. Otherwise, your little blue stem will get too tall and too fat and too happy and it will flop over. Um, this particular a shot was taken at the U.S. Botanic Garden, and I really love the way they use the soft, um, it's a linear texture, but it's soft and bending and flowing, and that's characteristic of little blue stem. And I think that really offsets the hard angles of the, the fence and the uh, very straight trunk of the tree. And in the foreground, they have some mountain mints that are in bloom and it just, it's, it's foamy. And I love the way they put this together. Little blue stem when it's used in the landscape is often used in a, a, en masse in, in large plantings. And one reason for that is that in a large planting, you can actually see a breeze move through an area by watching it move across the little blue stem. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous phenomenon. And in this particular setting, uh, the softness of the little blue stem, this is January. And this little blue stem is still a gorgeous uh, looking plant. And um, it really offsets that bold geometric pattern of the building. And for those of you that are curious, the tall evergreen shrubs are mountain laurels. This is a, a very acidic soil. And so uh, they've been able to pull that off. Little blue stem uh, will bend in the rain and the wind and the snow. And when it does that, it creates little lodges. And inside of these little lodges, uh, birds and insects find the shelter that they need to survive winter storms. And this process of, of grasses bending or flopping over is actually called lodging. And I don't know if it's called lodging because it creates lodging for, for insects and songbirds or not. But I can tell you that if you um, do plant some native grasses in your yard and you get to enjoy one of our winter snowstorms, that you will literally see that the juncos and the white-throated sparrows and the song sparrows will shelter under during a storm. And um, not only does it offer them protection from the weather, it also offers seeds, grass seeds are food for these birds, but it's also offering um, winter shelter for insects and insects are also food for birds. So the fact that our native grasses do sometimes flop over is actually really important. And it's unfortunate, you know, people don't like that look of the native grass flopping over. And so a lot of cultivars have been bred um, so that they will not do this. And it's a, a concern if, you, if you're really only thinking about how a garden looks, um, then the priority is to do whatever you need to do to make that garden look its best. But if you think about ecology and, and all of the interactions and relationships that our native plants have um, both with, you know, their own species that have to be able to cross pollinate and produce seeds, but also the relationships they have with other life in the native meadows. It's very important not to do anything that damages um, their ability to do that. And cross-pollinating with the cultivars that do not bend over during a storm is, is a concern that could be damaging, uh, the consequences could be damaging to ecosystems. So now here are some tips. 
Um, if you walk through a, a native, a wild native meadow, for example, that serpentine barren, you are not going to see little blue stem doing this unless it's, it has literally been a storm. Uh, but if you look at someone's little blue stem in a garden, you're going to see plants flopping over. And so plants, native grasses in our gardens flop over more than native grasses in the wild do. So you can, you can take this into your own hands and do these four things. And that will help to prevent your um, locally native, local ecotype, not cultivar, but your locally native grasses in your gardens to keep them from flopping over. If the plant, if the grass in question needs full sun, put it where it will get full sun. If you plant it in part shade, it, it, the stems will elongate in an attempt to reach the sun, and that's going to make this flopping over situation worse than it has to be. If the plant's adapted to really poor soil, don't plant it in a really nice soil that would produce a healthy lawn or a, or a respectable tomato bush that is going to make the grass fat and tall and happy and it's gonna fall over more than it would otherwise. Never, ever, ever, <laughs> almost never, ever actually give fertilizer to native plants. And you know, those of us who've worked with native plants a long time are going to think that's such a funny thing to say. But people who are just beginning to garden with native plants are going to be in the habit of providing fertilizer to lawns and fertilizer to flowers and, um, and vegetables and so forth. Your native plants uh, don't need that. In fact, it just makes matters worse. And then the other thing is if you go for a, a walk in a native meadow, you will see that native grasses are crowded in with other native grasses and lots of wildflowers. When we're first planting a, a garden bed, it is our habit uh, to clean that bed out so it's completely bare and then put things three feet on center and no plant really is touching any other plant in the beginning. And uh, that is also, it's unnatural. And um, if you do that, your grasses are going to flop over more than they have to. So I suggest trying those things if this bothers you, but in the winter, I would suggest you try enjoying it because it makes for some great bird watching. So grass number four, is switchgrass. And in this photograph, the switchgrass is over here right above the text. This is the biggest grass that we're going to talk about. And so it's a big plant like uh, the Chinese silvergrass is a big plant. <coughs> the height of switchgrass can be somewhat variable. Um, and they have a hard, shiny uh, bead like seeds. Um, so little beady seeds and the, the flowers and the seeds develop at the end of summer. And in this photograph for comparison over here there is some little blue stem and so you can see that the little blue stem is, is shorter, it's softer, the blades are curved, um, which is uh, quite a contrast to the switchgrass, which is a more, more vertical, stronger statement in the landscape. In nature, we find uh, in Maryland in particular, uh, switchgrass along our shorelines. So we see a lot of switchgrass in our coastal plain counties. And in the garden, uh, switchgrass enjoys anything from a moist to a fairly dry soil. Uh, full sun, you're just going to get better looking, more handsome plants in full sun. And you will find that there is some limited salinity tolerance. 
uh, probably comes from being a shoreline plant. Uh, I mentioned that this is, this is a big plant on the scale like Chinese silvergrass. And here at uh, Adkins Arboretum, they've taken advantage of this to do a really lovely arrangement of large plants. So you have the switchgrass in the foreground and then bayberries and then sumac with its red seed heads back here. And this just sort of naturally grades in to the surrounding woodland. This is my front yard, my switchgrass plant. Um, you cannot tell, but you're actually looking at the road. So this is the Snowmageddon. This was blizzard number one of Snowmageddon in 2009. And uh, that's one of the little, right down there, can you see that's the little um, white-throated sparrow? He's taking shelter in there. He is no longer at the base of the plant because he's standing on top of, at this point, about 18 inches of snow. Oh, for those of you that are also interested in the winter value of uh, native plants, uh, other good shelter plants in addition to native grasses are native asters and American holly and red cedar. Uh, the birds absolutely love those during snowstorms. Another thing that switchgrass is really good for is erosion control. And this is a shot of switchgrass that was just planted at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. Um, but you'll also see a lot of this around the Bay region with living shorelines and erosion control plantings. The next grass is purple top. And I think you can see from the photograph why it's called purple top. A really lovely and um, very underused native grass. Uh, typically between three and four feet tall, a little on the shorter side if it has been mown, a little on the taller side if it has not been mown. Fairly uniform in appearance. Um, the flowering starts in August and uh, proceeds on through late summer. Um, it's a... a, a grass in that if you pinch some of the, um, the, the little branches here on the flowering heads, if you pinch them between your thumb and your forefinger and rub back and forth, it will actually leave a, a greasy black mark on your fingers. And for that reason, sometimes it's called grease grass. From a distance, this is what purple top looks like. So this is what some people call a 55 mile per hour plant. In other words, you can easily see it and appreciate it even when you're driving by at high speeds. And uh, this would be the number one reason that you would want to consider including purple top in any native meadow planting uh, that you undertake. And one of the things that's very misleading, a lot of the literature that we get um, around here and the meadow mixes that are offered to us for sale are based on the four major grasses of the prairie states. So that's a meadow system on the opposite side of the Appalachian meadows. Our meadows are different, they have different grasses, and this is a really appropriate grass for native meadows here. Appropriate and beautiful. The second reason you would want to include purple top in your meadow mix is its structure. The grass blades are, are down low, close to the ground, and then there's a very thin stem, and then the seed head is up at the top. So there's like this window that allows you to see all the beautiful flowers that you put in your native meadow. A lot of grasses um, that you could plant, you would not be able to see the native flowers unless you were standing very close to them. So on the left uh, is a naturally occurring population of uh, purple top just on a roadside. And if you keep your eyes open, you know, mostly focused on the road, but occasionally looking at roadside vegetation, you're going to see a lot of roadside purple top. So 
from that, you can know that there's some, some salinity tolerance, uh, but also some tolerance of being mown maybe once or twice a year. Uh, and then the photograph on the right actually um, comes from a group in, in Florida, a group of people who use proceeds from license plate sales, wildflower license plate sales. Um, and they produce native seeds and native plants. And uh, you can see that the, the seed heads on the purple top are literally a foot or more higher up than the foliage. And so that's why it gives you that beautiful uh, visibility of the wildflowers in the meadow. The growing conditions, purple top is really very flexible plant, moderate to dry soils and full sun. Uh, and again, you know, this is something that you would have an option of planting on your curbside because it can handle some road salt. Purple love grass is a fairly short grass and the, the foliage part, the leaves down here are only about a foot tall, but when the flower heads emerge, and the seeds start to ripen, it, add, it literally doubles the height of the plant. In nature, you find large populations of purple top, which in here are these um, sort of hazy, short, reddish brown areas. It's a little bit there. Um, you find the really large populations of purple top in very sandy, very well-drained soils the same kind of soil that you will occasionally find cactus in. Um, but you find small quantities of small numbers of plants in all different kinds of dry soils throughout the state. So the growing conditions for purple lovegrass, did I say purple top when I was talking on that last slide? If I said that, it, I meant purple lovegrass. Um, purple lovegrass in the garden, uh, again, you want to have that, those dry conditions and the full sun, but because you're working in a garden, you can have a really wide range of soil textures. So the soil texture for the garden shown here is horrible. And many of you that have gardens in suburban Maryland somewhere are familiar with this sort of combination of silt and clay and sand that's all been compacted and it's full of, you know, old wires and, and broken bricks. And that's the soil we have here. So it's, um, uh, Purple Top is really tolerant of a diverse, types of soil in a garden. But if you're going to plant it in a meadow, you want to stick with that natural habitat soil, which is sand, because you want lots of the purple lovegrass to survive and thrive in your meadow. You're going to emulate that um, natural plant community. And the reason you can do this in a garden on just any nasty old soil is because you, as the gardener, control the competition. In a meadow, uh, generally the expectation is that you're going to do a lot less weeding in a meadow planting. And you want your plants to get in there and fend for themselves. So if you're doing a meadow with um, purple lovegrass, go for the sand. So here's purple lovegrass in a garden planting. And uh, the designer for this garden chose the purple lovegrass very specifically because the building and the sculpture have very hard um, texture and very angular lines. And the purple lovegrass provides a really beautiful counterpoint to that. Uh, this is New York City Parks, and um, the purple lovegrass is in the foreground. When it's in, in flower, it's literally hard to see the grass blades. Um, 
And the, uh, the goldenrod, if you're interested, uh, in the midground is uh, grass leaf goldenrod. So grass number seven is called wood oats. And it's a fairly short grass, typically somewhere two to three feet tall. And the, um, the grass flowers and begins developing seeds in midsummer. Its natural habitat is uh, an affiliation with rivers and streams. So it's either on the river bank or the stream bank or in the floodplain around a river or a stream. Uh, back to the wood oats on my curb. Um, the garden conditions can, you can garden with this in moist to dry soils. And it's, it's um, in nature, it's found in shady places on those stream banks and floodplains. So it's found in the woods. Uh, so partial sun is, is good. But I did say there was going to be an exception, you know, in terms of uh, drawing a line between the natural habitat. Um, and we just saw that with the purple lovegrass. If you're doing a garden, you can go into different soil textures. But with the wood oats, I would actually advise you to depart from that moist soil because wood oats is really aggressive. Uh, it self sows very aggressively, and actually the seedlings are kind of hard to pull once they're established. So you might actually want to stick towards really dry soils for working with wood oats. I like to use it. Um, it's got a particular pale sort of lime green that I find very attractive. Uh, here I've paired it with woodland sunflower, which has a naturally dark foliage. It's fantastic for dried arrangements. Um, but again, remember, it's a fairly aggressive. I don't want you to send me hate mail. Sarah, I planted wood oats and now it's everywhere. Um, so be careful. So the eighth plant that we're going to talk about is called wool grass, but it's actually a sedge. But I threw it in here just for fun, even though it's a sedge. Um, it has that strong linear texture and the big, beautiful seed head. Uh, it's typically, oh, and I should say in this photograph, since there are several things, that this plant right here is the wool grass. It's typically about three to four feet tall. Um, and it's late summer with the flowering and the seed development. Uh, and like most sedges, the, the, the blades at the base of the plant have a somewhat evergreen quality. This is just a close-up of the, uh, the seed head, and this is where it gets its name from. It's a very woolly looking seed head. In nature, you find wool grass at the base of a slope or in a low area. This little wetland area right here is just full of wool grass. In the gardens, you wanna stick with something that's um, moist or wet, uh, the more attractive plants will be in full sun. This particular uh, garden, which was designed by Michaela Bully at the Talbot County Extension Office, um, is fed uh, in between rainfall events by a rain barrel, so it stays consistently moist. Now, I mentioned before that um, our native grasses have really important work to do. They have to cross-pollinate, they have to produce seeds, and they, um, they support insects and songbirds and fox turtles and bob whites and all manner of things. And so I also mentioned that these pollen, uh, the grass pollen from the anthers, the yellow anthers that you see here, moves constantly from our yards into wild populations. And so I would encourage you when you go out looking uh, to get the grasses to plant in your yard, to patronize a store or a business that is going to sell you locally native grasses. That way the pollen that leaves your yard will be beneficial 
to wild plant populations rather than potentially harmful or damaging. Now, if you can't find uh, some wild locally native grasses, this is incredibly easy to collect a little bit of grass seed and grow your own. So I couldn't resist calling this slide Grow Your Own Grass, but I am talking about grass here. <laughs> um, and grow a just wild collective, super tiny amount of seed, like less than an eighth of a teaspoon of seed is going to be hundreds of seeds. And put that in a pot on some potting soil, just sprinkle it over the surface, and then cover it with a really thin layer of potting soil and place your pot outside. Um, put it just outside. At whatever time of year you collected the grass seeds is the time of year to do this. And put that pot someplace that when you water other plants in your yard, this pot will get some water. And you will see little seedlings in this no later than the following May. You may see some seedlings in the fall, but you will definitely see some seedlings in May. And then you break up that potting soil and you plant those little seedlings wherever you want your native grasses. Super cheap, incredibly easy to do. Some general tips for native grass maintenance are native, using native grasses. They are all very deer resistant. Um, I like to cut mine back in March. Uh, they're usually looking a little bit tattered by then. Um, you're going to have Sam Drogi talking. Sam Drogi is a native bee expert. He will point out that if you leave about two feet of the native grass stem, when you cut them back, you're providing excellent habitat for are very tiny little native bees. There are species that nest in our native grass stems. And then I already mentioned the biggest problem that you're going to have with native grass maintenance is that they will self sow. Um, you're not going to remove the seeds because you planted it so that you could enjoy the beautiful seed heads or so that the birds would have seeds to eat, right? So that would be one option but you're not gonna to wanna to do that. Uh, if you get on the little grass seedlings in May, uh, before they've really deeply rooted, they're fairly easy to pull or just kill with a hoe, a very shallow working of the hoe. Um, if you're starting your own grass plants from seeds, then you literally have the control where you could only plant one individual. Most grass species need a mate to produce really good vigorous seeds. If you only plant one, it's like a specimen grass, um, you won't have much self-sowing unless there are mates around. So that's everything I had to say about working with native grasses in your gardens and your meadows. Um, and I know you're all just absolutely dying to hear the presidential candidate debates. So, but it does leave us a little time for questions, doesn't it, Anne? Yes. You have a number of questions, Sarah, and we'll try to move through them quickly so that everyone can watch the debate. But uh, there were several questions about wood oats. Um, is this uh, chasmanthium latifolium? Yes. Okay, um, now we'll move through the questions. Is a nimble will, the audience member has a patch that has gone to seed and wants to harvest the seeds to spread to other areas that are being invaded by stilt grass. And she wants to know how the seed is ripe and the best time to broadcast it and any other tips for spreading nimble will. Wow, okay, so um, I love nimble will. You know, a lot of people are like, that's a lawn weed, right? So that uh, a lot of people that I've, I've worked with would be horrified to hear that you're collecting the seed and <laughs> spreading it around. But I'm with you. I love nimble will. Um, I have not personally ever wild collected the seed. But generally speaking, when you're wild collecting a seed from, seed from grasses, um, you 
hold the stem or hold the plant, in the case of nimble will, because it's so small, and just uh, very gently move your fingers along the, um, the seed head. And if the seed comes off very easily in your fingers, then it's ripe and it's ready to collect. So you're gonna wanna do that. You may need to have a little piece of paper or something if the seeds don't stay in your hand and they fall down. Now, uh, to spread the seeds, I would recommend what we do when we're sowing native meadows. If you're doing a few hundred square feet or a larger area, which is to mix it in with some other uh, granular, cheap material. It can be anything. It could be yard soil you threw in your bucket. Um, and spread about a half of that over the whole area, and then go back and spread the second half of it over the whole area. Next, we have a couple of questions about bottle brush. Is it appropriate for Garrett County? And if so, where can the questioner get seed? And the second question is whether ground eggshell is a good calcium addition for bottle brush. Um, I think the answer to all those questions is yes, except for where can you get seed? Um, and yikes, I, I, would, I would contact the Western Maryland chapter. Um, I think you would have to wild collect the seed to get some seed. And um, Maryland Native Plant Society uh, did at one time have a, a guide to wild collecting seed. There are some things to know, including not hurting the parent population. Um, but the National Native Plant Society has a guide on that too. So if you're gonna go wild seed collecting, you might wanna, you might wanna read that. And, and it has other useful tips in it as well. Uh, but yes, it's appropriate for uh, anywhere in Maryland. And um, I think ground eggshells should be fine. Okay, concerning Indian grass, one person has asked whether there are shorter cultivars of Indian grass, and another person has asked whether it is a good substitute for Calamagrostis acutifolia, Carl Forster. <laughs> oh, what an interesting pair of questions. Um, okay, so there are cultivars of all of the native grasses. Um, that were almost all of them. The, the height of Indian grass is ecologically important. It's important for Indian grass to be able to get to a certain height to get the pollen in the wind. It's important for birds that are taking the seed from the Indian grass. Um, it, literally every interaction for Indian grass to compete with other plants in meadows it needs to be a certain height. Um, all of that has been determined by uh, thousands and millions of years of these plants evolving in the same place, in the same habitat, and constantly adapting to each other. So I would invite you to consider um, that if you want a shorter grass, that you choose a species that is a shorter grass. Uh, rather than um, genetically modifying a species to be shorter than it is naturally. Because the pollen from your garden, which is carried on the wind, will go to wild plant populations and the genes, the genetically modified genes uh, which have a horticultural or horticultural desire to have shorter grasses will be transmitted to wild populations. And they can have all kinds of consequences. You would think there would be like some testing program, right? To see if it's, if it's safe to genetically modify our native grasses and, and sell. And this is not a minor thing. There will be tens of thousands um, of Indian grass cultivars alone, many tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands, uh, sold in Maryland alone this year. 
So this is not a, ma a minor issue of gene flow. So um, yes, there are cultivars. The other thing to know about cultivars of native grasses, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're interested in planting native meadows is that many cultivars of native grasses uh, were actually intentionally bred to be more aggressive than their wild counterparts. Um, and if we had time, I could get into why that is. But what's important right now is to know if you're planting a native meadow and you use cultivars of native grasses, they will, many of them will completely crowd out your wildflowers. Um, and that's, uh, there are cultivars of Indian grass that are cultivars of switchgrass that do that and cultivars of big bluestem uh, that do that. And I, I don't really recommend that you use big blue stem at all. But um, yeah, so we have a cultivar problem. On the other hand, Carl Furster is a cultivar. Um, and I highly recommend that one, which is weird because um, I think it's a cultivar of an alien plant, but I'm not sure. Is it a cultivar of a native? It, it might, it might, um, I think the Amophilum, I've never heard anyone give me the scientific name of it before but I recognize that. Now I'm thinking it might be a native. If they would make cultivars of native plants that were sterile, that would be fine because the pollen couldn't go cross pollinate and have these potentially negative impacts on wild plant populations. So whether Carl Forster is a, a cultivar of a native plant or an alien grass, either way, I think if you think it's beautiful, I think that's absolutely great. And you should support that cultivar. And it's short. Okay, on to little blue stem. Several people have asked whether it spreads, whether it would compete well with weeds and non-native invasives. Yeah, little blue stem is not an aggressive grass. So if you're looking, if you're looking for a, a sort of a thug that can compete with invasive plants, um, I would choose something more aggressive. Uh, if I were in the coastal plain, for example, I would consider Florida Pastalum. That's a, a really good one. Um, yeah, I, I need to know need to know more about the specifics of the situation. Switchgrass is very, it can be quite aggressive. Um, that would be another one to consider. Again, I would really tend to use the switchgrass in a coastal plain uh, restoration sort of setting. Um, Virginia wild rye is very good. And uh, if you're working in the shade, actually the bottle brush grass, if there's enough calcium in the soil, can be very good for that. Another person asked, isn't lodging the goal for little blue stem for it to be an important element in the ecosystem? Um, yeah, so um, I thought about that when I was writing the talk because it kind of makes it confusing. Uh, what happens is in our gardens, it's really hard to avoid giving little blue stem a soil that has more nutrients in it than it would have, or more organic matter than it would have in a wild meadow. Um, and so it, in our gardens, little blue stem is going to be prone to lodge. And um, yes, we, we do want little blue stem to lodge uh, under circumstances that are similar to where you see it lodge in the wild. But in our gardens, it, it lodges a good bit more than that. And since people find that unattractive, I provided the advice to help uh, minimize that down to levels that are compatible with what you would see in the wild. Next, a general question, is using leaf grow with native grasses okay? Well, it's okay. I'm not going to come over to your yard and say, you're bad. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. It's okay. Um, the challenge, the challenge is uh, if you have a grass, little blue stem is an example, that's adapted to really poor soils, 
um, and you're adding organic matter to the soil, then you're enriching the soil and um, it, it's going to lead to overly happy, happy plants that lodge a lot. Are little blue stem or any other grasses good to use as a transition between mowed or mulched paths and large flowering meadow planting? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, so I think that's a great, a great tool. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that that can be used. If you do an edge on a meadow planting, see a lot of people do their meadow plantings uh, where there's an edge where the meadow meets a lawn. And the big challenge there is that the turf grasses will get in, right? Um, and so the challenge is how do you keep the turf, because when the turf grass gets into the meadow planting, it kills the meadow. It's a very aggressive alien grass. Um, if you plant a monoculture of anything along the edge of your meadow, then it's very easy for you or for volunteers to get in there and say, hey, the edge of this meadow is only supposed to be that one thing. This grass that's in here is something else, I'll kill it. But it's very difficult for people who don't know how to recognize grass, one grass from another, to get into a grass bed and say, oh, well, this is a good grass and that's a bad grass. And so I'll pull this one and keep that one. And it's just way beyond the skill set of 99.9% .9 of people, right? Not in the Maryland Native Plant Society, of course, but the vast majority of people cannot do that. So that's a great thing to do um, if you are someone who uses chemicals uh, to maintain your meadow, uh, having either a pure grass edge or a pure broadleaf plant edge provides you chemical options that you would not have had otherwise. Um, Sarah, next we have a question from someone who would like to know how to contact you because they would like to hire you. Now, I don't know if you're interested, but I just thought I would pass that along. That sounds fantastic. Um, I think probably the easiest thing is to email you, Anne. Is that um, what? Yes, if you want to send an email to fieldtrips at mdflora.org, I will get it and forward that on to Sarah. And then we'll be hooked up. Thank you, Anne. Sorry to impose. No problem. Um, another general question, what is the wildlife value for all of the grasses you discussed, not just little blue stem? Yeah, so um, the wildlife value of the grasses is absolutely fascinating. There is a website called Illinois Wildflowers. And on Illinois Wild, have you seen that website, Ann? You have this look of recognition. I love that website. Um, the, there's a section in the description of each plant where the, the author lists of flor, uh, faunal interactions. And so for each one of these native grasses, you will just literally see a dozen or more um, insects, birds, and mammals that interact with that grass. And some of them are like generalist uh, grasshoppers that eat lots of different kinds of grass. And some of them are specialists, like grasshoppers that prefer this particular kind of grass, or, or butterflies, or moths, um, and, and birds. And it goes, it goes on and on. And what I would love to do if I had time is actually try to do some sort of diagram that shows all of these different things and how they relate to, um, to each of the grasses. And it's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And, you know, we tell people, oh, the native plants support these insects. But... Every, like literally every native plant supports all different kinds of insects. Um, and many of, the, of them are fairly specific and many of them are generalist. And native plants literally make the world go round. Okay, does switchgrass belong in the Piedmont? You know, I, 
I was actually thinking about this. According to the maps and the descriptions, you can find switchgrass in the Piedmont, you can find it in the mountains. And I have literally never one time seen it. Um, and so I, I would put this up to the, uh, the members of the Maryland Native Plant Society. Sh please show us some switchgrass that's not in the coastal plain. I would absolutely love to see that. Okay. I think Everyone be on the lookout for that. Since the 19th. Yeah, yeah, post it on the Facebook page. For purple top grass, what is the best time to seed an area with purple top grass? So um, for wild local ecotype grass seeds, uh, what you want to do is seed them in the fall. And the reason I say that is the locally native seeds need to be moist and cold. Uh, the, the, that's an adaptation to prevent, prevent the seeds from accidentally germinating before winter is over. So they need a certain period of, of cold and moist. And the, the reason I said local ecotype is because one of the big things, uh, common things that is bred into grass cultivars is to remove the dormancy from the seed. And seed dormancy from an ecological point of view is incredibly important. We do not want a lack of seed dormancy being transferred to wild populations. Um, but if, if you are using cultivar seed, uh, then you need to know if that's one of the cultivars that lacks dormancy, because then you can plant that in, in May and it will still germinate. Questions about purple lovegrass. Can it be used in rain gardens? Is it best in the front of the garden? Is it okay for light shade? And how do you distinguish purple lovegrass from purple top? Yeah, okay. Um, so if you have one of those rain gardens that has a very sandy substrate, um, some rain gardens have a top layer with a lot of sand, uh, and it's a rain garden that is not constantly moist. So it gets occasional rain, the rain moves through quickly. I think that would probably work. Um, I don't know what the salinity tolerance of purple lovegrass is. So if that rain garden's receiving some salt uh, from you know, sidewalks or driveways, I, I don't know what the influence of that would be. Um, purple lovegrass uh, shade, I strongly encourage you to resist the temptation to plant uh, these grasses in more shade than you find them in nature if you want them to be beautiful, if, if aesthetics is a big concern. Uh, I'm sure you'll find a few lovegrasses in nature that get an hour or two of shade each day. Um, but they're, they're really not partial shade plants. Uh, if you want a grass for shade, you might look at the wood oats um, or uh, descampsia or some of our beautiful native sedges uh, would be good candidates for that. Um, how to tell purple top from purple love grass, since they both have these beautiful purple tops that, that pop out at the same time of year. Uh, the purple top is going to be about three feet tall, and um, there will be sort of each, each top will have a single stem that's uh, about three feet tall that comes up above the blades. The purple love grass, the whole plant in, with the flowers is only about two feet tall, and the grass blades are like a foot tall or less. And there's, there's no stem that just like kind of long stem connecting the two. Are all the grasses you mentioned beneficial to birds for their seed? And if not, which would be good to supply seed for birds? Okay, um, if you are in the coastal plain, and I know we have a, an audience, some people who don't necessarily know coastal plain, Piedmont Mountain, that kind of thing. If your uh, garden is east of I-95, you are almost certainly in the coastal plain. Far and away, the 
best grass for providing bird seed. I mean, the birds will go bonkers over Florida Pastbalum. A Pastbalum is P as in Paul, A S as in Sam, P as in Paul, A L U M as in Mary, Pastbalum. The, the, they absolutely love the seeds from, it's insane. So you'll have lots of fun with that. It's um, not, okay, I'm in love, right, with native grasses. I think they're all beautiful, right? Um, it's, a, it's a plant that has a beautiful color, uh, but the seeds are perhaps, the seed heads are not the most attractive seed heads in the grass world. Um, but I, I think they're beautiful. <laughs> Do native grasses require periodic replanting or rejuvenation? Um, that probably varies somewhat according to species. Uh, the, the little switch grasses I showed you in the pictures of my curbside garden um, are now monstrous. They're huge. I mean, you could park a car and it would not be bigger than these switchgrasses. And so uh, I think it would be time to dig those up and divide them. And, and, but they don't need rejuvenation in the sense of um, they're not unhealthy or anything. They're quite vigorous. Um, I, I'm sure there must be some native grasses that would benefit from that. But generally speaking, no. Well, thank you, Sarah, for your wonderful presentation. And there are many people thanking you in the Q&A and in the chat also. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone. And thank you, Ann and Lynn. Well, for you too. Thank you. Good night. Good night.